The following content is provided by MIT OpenCourseWare under a Creative Commons license. Additional information about our license and MIT OpenCourseWare in general is available at ocw.mit.edu. All right, so what we're working on today is uh, we're still talking about buffers. So this is from the handout from Friday. And we'll be continuing throughout today and probably a little bit on Wednesday on acid-base titrations. So this is all in the acid-base equilibrium uh, unit. So we're talking about buffers. So we're talking about buffers. And so a buffer is a, a buffering agent is something that where you can add acid or base and the pH stays pretty much neutral. So you usually add a an acid and its conjugate base in the form of a salt, or you add a base and its conjugate acid in the form of a salt. So uh, you have a dynamic equilibrium going, and when you add acid or base, the buffering system acts as a source of protons or a sink of protons to keep the pH pretty much constant. So let's work through a, a buffering problem and consider first the initial buffering material and then what happens if you add something to it, you stress the system, add an acid or a base, how the pH is affected by that. So in this case, we're adding one mole of an acid and 0.5 moles of its conjugate base in the form of a salt, form of a sodium salt in this case, and they are added together, uh, and you add water and bring the total volume up to one, one liter. And you're given information about the Ka of this particular acid and asked to calculate the pH under these conditions. So you can write this out, as we've seen before, as an acid in water leading to hydronium ions and the conjugate base. And so, so you can set up a table to see how much uh, you have in the beginning and what you'll have at equilibrium. So we can set up this initial molarity, change in molarity, and equilibrium molarity. But this time we have something different. So now we have acid and the conjugate base when we start. In the problems we've looked at up until this point, these guys were both zero when we started. But in a buffer problem, it's not zero. You have some amount in there. And so we had one mole in one liter, or molarity of one, 0.5 moles in one liter, or 0.5 molar. Now, as it comes to equilibrium, we have the same kind of change. We have minus x over here, plus x here, and plus x here. And then at equilibrium, we'd have 1 minus x, x, and 0.5 plus x on the other side. And really, a, a lot of the trick to doing these buffer problems is remembering that you're starting with something here and here. So that's, that's really, it's not much more complicated than that than that recognition, and you would need to have both, otherwise it's not going to be a good buffer. So now, if you have this information set up, you know the Ka, we can solve for x, and x is what we want because we want pH, and pH is minus log of the hydronium ion concentration. So we can set this up, we're given the Ka, and this is going to be equal to products over reactants, the concentrations at equilibrium. So we have hydronium ion, the conjugate base, over the conjugate acid. And so we can fill this in, 0 0.500 plus x times x over 1 minus x. Now here you can do what we talked about last time, and that is to first simplify and see if we can get rid of these x's here to make it easier to solve. Or you can use the quadratic equation, but on the exam with the calculators you have, that's a little more time consuming. So it's nice to see if you can simplify. Basically, we're saying, how big is x if x is a small enough number that it doesn't really change this 1 or this 0.5, then you can sort of ignore it and solve for x that way. <coughs> 
So uh, this is just written up again that we had on the last slide. So we're going to first try the approximation that x is small compared to 1 and compared to 0.5 and uh, solve that way and then go back and check and see whether that was valid or not. So if we uh, assume it's small, we can rewrite that equation as 0.5 times x over 1, which makes it easier to solve, and get an answer for x, which in this case is 3.54 times 10 to the minus 4 mol molar. And now we can go back and uh, take this number divided by 0.5 and see whether um, it's less than 5% of 0.5. So we're going to check the assumption and say, is this small? And you don't need to do both. If it's small compared to 0.5, it'll also be small compared to 1. So you can just do, uh, look at the smaller number of, of the two. And uh, here it's less than 0.1%, so that's less than 5%, so that assumption was OK. So you can just go ahead uh, with this number. Again, we have the 5% uh, rule there. So this is the hydronium ion concentration, that was x. And so uh, now we can find out the pH by taking minus the log of that value. And that gives us an answer of 3.45. And we have two significant figures after the decimal point because there, was, there were two significant figures in the volume. All right, so that's how you look at a buffer problem. And now we can say, all right, was this a good buffer? Let's consider what happens if we add some strong acid, HCl, 0.1 moles of it, um, to the solution. Again, we're now, in this case, we're keeping the total volume at one liter. So if you had made up your buffer and added that 0.1 moles of the strong acid to it, what would be your pH? Is it about the same, or did it dramatically change the pH of the solution? All right, so now you have to do some subtractions to do this kind of problem. And you have to remember what we know about strong acids. So HCl is definitely a strong acid. And so that we assume that when we add 0.1 moles of it, that it's going to react completely. So when you're adding the 0.1 moles, it will react with equal number of moles of the base. The base is going to act as the sink for protons. It'll react with the acid and you will form the conjugate then the same equal number of moles of the conjugate. So here the base is reacting with the acid and trying to neutralize the pH. So if we, uh, if we consider the HCOO minus here, what we had originally, we had 0.5 moles. Now it's reacted with 0.1 moles of the HCl, and so you only have 0.4 left. And we have 0.4 in one liter. We always need to convert to molarity for these problems. Now in terms of the conjugate acid over here, we had one mole to begin with. Now we have 0.1 moles more because the strong acid reacted with the conjugate base to form more of the conjugate acid. So now our total is 1.1. And that 1.1 is in that one liter, and so we have a new molarity. So now we can just do the same thing we did before and solve for x, the hydronium ion concentration, which will give us the pH. So we can set up this expression again. And so now we have to put in our new amounts, our 1.1 over here and our 0.4 over here. We're still going to reach an equilibrium x will be converted to plus x over here. So we have 1.1 minus x, 0.4 plus x. We can use the same Ka value that we had before to solve. We can use the same, the, uh, same approximations, set up the same equations, put in our, our, new, our new values over here, um, do the same, same simplification, see if that works solve for x, uh, value for x now is 4.87 times 10 to the minus 4, and that's still OK. It's only 0.12% of the smaller number, the 0.4 number, so that's less than 5%, so that's, that's fine. 
and we can solve then for pH. And uh, now we get a pH of 3.31, uh, two significant figures after the decimal point. So uh, we had before, initially, in a solution that didn't have the strong acid, we had a pH of 3.45. With 0.1 moles of strong acid added, the pH has changed slightly to 3.31. So that's a decent buffer. It didn't change really dramatically when you added some strong acid. So this is a way that you can manipulate a buffer. If you're trying to design a buffer at an exact pH, then you can calculate, you know, you look at what kind of buffering agent you want to use and figure out how much strong acid or base you might have to add to it to sort of adjust the pH to where you want it to be. So that's a buffer, that's uh, one way of doing a, a buffer problem. Now let's consider uh, designing a buffer and how we think about going about if you're in a biochem lab, for example, and you're said, okay, you need to buffer something at this pH, how could you set these things up? Um, some of the things that you would think about, they think about the ratio of uh, the acid to its conjugate. So the conjugate acid base pair, what ratio they have the pKa of, of the acid, where, what B, pH you want to, uh, where you want to be for your particular condition. All right, so now we're going to derive an equation that's going to help you in designing buffers and in doing buffer problems. So here comes a derivation. The derivation starts with a generic equation for an acid buffer problem. We have an acid HA in water forming hydronium ions and the conjugate base. We also know Ka, the generic expression for Ka, products over reactants, or in the case of uh, this uh, acid in water, we have hydronium ions times the conjugate base over the conjugate acid. Now we can take this expression and rearrange it. So we can bring Ka to the other side and hydronium ions to the other side of the equation. And then we can take the log of both sides of the equation and multiply both sides by minus one. So this is the equation we would get as a result of those manipulations. So what is minus log of the hydronium ion concentration? What else is that equal to? pH. And what about minus log of Ka? What's that equal to? pKa. So we can substitute those in. So pH is going to equal pKa minus the log of the concentration of the acid over the concentration of its conjugate base. And here, these are equilibrium concentrations because it came from that equilibrium expression. Now, this is not that useful an expression to us, and we want to see whether we can uh, make it more useful. And what would make it more useful is if we consider the initial concentrations of the acid and its conjugate base rather than the equilibrium concentrations. This will make it a more useful expression. Uh, at least Henderson and Hasselbach thought that was a pretty useful expression. And I guess other people thought it was as well, since now it has the name Henderson-Hasselbach uh, equation. So usually things don't get named unless they turn out to be fairly useful. So the simplification, the approximation that's being made here is that the initial concentrations are similar enough to the equilibrium concentrations. So let's consider when, in fact, that would be true. Okay, so here are just the same uh, expressions again. And what this is really saying is that x is small, something that we've been talking about for the, uh, the last couple of days. Uh, x, in this case, or the, the acid um, in, in equilibrium with its conjugate base, X, the hydronium ion concentration, is small compared to the initial concentration of the acid in the conjugate base. So the equilibrium concentrations are more or less the same as the initial concentrations. 
So this is that approximation that we've been using, and we've been using that 5% rule, which we'll continue to use for the Henderson-Hasselbalch. So this is assuming x is pretty small. So another way of thinking about this is that a weak acid typically only loses a small fraction of its protons or hydrogen ions. So that's, it's weak. By definition, a weak acid only loses a small amount. A strong acid, on the other hand, pretty much ionizes completely. Uh, and a weak base typically only accepts a small fraction of uh, protons or hydrogen ions. So most of the time, X is small. Most of the time, there isn't a huge change. And most of the time, you can use that 5% rule. Most of the time, the initial concentrations are not all that different from the equilibrium concentrations. So this, uh, this holds a lot of the time. And again, the rule we'll be using is this, uh, this 5% that the concentration of hydronium ions needs to be small. Uh, this over HA or A minus, whichever of these is a smaller number, needs to be less than 5%. And if it is, then you can use this expression. OK. And that expression, you will find out, turns out to make your lives a lot easier in doing these problems. So now let's use this to design a buffer. So when would you use Henderson-Hasselbalch? We can consider it right here. Now suppose you wanted a buffer that's going to buffer in the acidic range, around 4.6. So what we would do is go to a table in the book and see which acids have a pKa around 4.6? And we can look down here. That one's pretty close. Let's see. Uh, acetic acid, that's not bad. That's around that pH. Let's pick that one. There's a couple other options, but that was one that would work. So acetic acid is suitable. It has a pKa 4.75. And we want something around the pH of 4.6. And so most buffer solutions, something's effective to buffer at a particular pH if its pKa is plus or minus 1 from that pH. So if the pKa is more than 1 away from the desired pH, that is not going to be a particularly good buffer. So you want it within that range of plus or minus 1. Uh, and that becomes important if you have, say, an enzyme that you're studying in a biochemistry lab. And if you're doing it at the wrong pH, you're not going to, the, the enzyme may not be happy at all. You might not get any results. OK, so let's use Henderson-Hasselbalch now uh, to, uh, to consider how much of each thing we should add to make a pretty good buffer. So here's our equation again, and we can consider these uh, original concentrations of, these, uh, of the acid in its conjugate base. So now we can rearrange this uh, to solve for things that we know. So we know the pKa and we know the pH that we want. And so the pKa was 4.75. The pH that we want is 4.6. So we subtract that, we get 0.15. And then if we do uh, inverse log over here, we find that uh, the ratio of the acid to the conjugate base that we should add is a 1.4 uh, ratio of those two. So what does this mean? OK, how much would you then add? Well, you could, with this ratio, add 1.4 molar of the acid and 1 molar of the conjugate base. But the exact amounts are not as important as the ratio. The ratio here is quite important because, again, for it to be a good buffer, it needs to be able to go both directions. If you add strong acid, then that strong acid needs to be able to react with the conjugate base to keep the pH constant. If you add strong base, it needs to be able to react with the conjugate acid, again, to keep the pH constant. So the ratio is, in, is important here. Um, so the ratio is more important than the exact amounts. But if you add too little, then you don't have enough what's called buffering capacity. And you have less uh, resistance to change. So the more that you have, the more resistant to change the buffer will be. 
So higher concentrations, the less likely it is that there'll be a problem that you'll you know, sort of swamp out your system by adding too much acid or base. All right, and if you use too low concentrations, then you're not going to make your 5% rule, uh, and the Henderson-Hasselbach equation won't be valid, and you'll not end up with the, the pH that you think you're going to, because uh, th this won't tell you the right answer under those conditions. So what would that be? Well, you can go back and calculate what, what sort of, what's the minimum concentration that one would need to uh, keep your 5% rule. So for a pH of 4.6, that's equal to hydronium ion concentration of 2.5 times 10 to the minus 5. And so if you put that up here, then either of these, the smaller one of these, um, for this to be less than 5%, you can go back and calculate. And so you would need at least 5 times 10 to the minus 4 over here for the 5% rule to work. If you had less than that, then, uh, then the equation wouldn't be valid. Okay, so uh, we're working our way through, through this list, and we'll move into uh, today's handout. So remember, there's only five types of problems, and the trick is to figure out which type of problem it is and apply the right kind of procedure to it. And actually, the, the two easiest ones we have left, which are the strong acid and the strong base in water, and then we're going to go into acid-base titrations, which in one problem of an acid-base titration, you can do almost all of these different types of problems. So they're just sort of a, titrations are really a summary of all the types of problems put into one problem. So acid-base titrations. And I'll say before we get started that Acid-base titration problems are often the problems in this half of the course that people struggle with. Although um, the year before last, there was an actually quite good performance on acid-base titrations. And so last year I told the class uh, that the year before had been quite good, and I was curious to see how they would do in comparison to this pretty good year. And um, they uh, responded and they did a really fantastic job. So I'm beginning to think that this, in fact, is not a hard unit necessarily. And uh, people, it's, it takes, it's a little bit different, I think. But you know, you just, you have to work the problems. And there are problems on the problem set to work. And uh, then it starts to come together. So I'm, I'm really optimistic that this year's class can even outperform last year's class. I mean, you did on exam two. So uh, I feel like uh, this would be a little contest to see if people can do better than last year. Um, acid base titrations, you'll see them again if you take Organic chemistry, you'll talk about pKa's all the time. Biochemistry, you're going to talk about acids and bases and buffers and pKa's. And if any of you are going to medical school, oh boy, will it be back big time. Uh, when I was a graduate student, I TA'd medical students. And pretty much all we were doing was acid-based titrations getting through it. So if you learn it now, you're just going to make uh, many, many years ahead be much easier. All right, so acid-based titrations. What is this? Well, you're basically titrating an acid with a base or a base with an acid. So um, often they're used to find out an unknown concentration. So uh, if you know the concentration of one thing you're adding, you can find out the other. Um, and uh, so let's just uh, look at, at some of these things. So you have here, uh, you would have a strong base on top in this picture, and a strong acid in this flask here. And you're dripping amounts of strong base into the strong acid. And you can calculate out a titration curve. So here we have pH versus volume of base added. At the very beginning, we're at very acidic pH. We only have strong acid at zero volume. And then as you add base, you eventually get to a point called the equivalence point or the stoichiometric point, or sometimes called the end point. Uh, and here are some of the definitions of those. So basically here, the number of moles of acid is equal to the number of moles of base that you've added. 
So equivalents are stoichiometric because they're uh, equal amounts here. And it's often called the end point because experimentally, when you get to that point, you're at the end of your experiment. And uh, this one is really a theoretical. Uh, this is uh, experimental. They should, they should, in fact, equal each other. Uh, you can measure pH up here with a pH meter. And then when you're doing these kinds of acid-base titrations, you often uh, see something like this. So you have some kind of dye, which indicates when you've reached the end point. And so it'll be clear, 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 clear. And all of a sudden, you'll start uh, seeing this change in color. And you want to uh, measure the end point when you just start to see that change. So how many of you have actually done these titrations in a lab? Oh, almost everybody, OK. So what happens often, at least when I did it, um, you'd be going along really slowly, drip, any change, drip, any change. And finally, you just get incredibly frustrated, and you add just a little bit more. And all of a sudden, it's like really, really bright color, and you've gone too far. Um, but then you can sometimes back calculate approximately where the endpoint should be and go fast to that point and then go kind of slowly. Uh, and so it sometimes helps to be able to do these sort of uh, theoretical calculations to help you figure out when you need to drip slowly. How many of you have had that same kind of experience of really, really slow and then all of a sudden bright colors? How many people did it perfectly the fir one time? OK, we have just a handful of people who did that perfectly. All right, so some people ask me, um, you know, why don't we have a lab course affiliated with our uh, GIR courses? A lot of times you have a lab course for freshman chemistry or for uh, first year of physics and this kind of thing. Um, it would be hard because you take so many courses, uh, science courses at once, to have a lot of the labs, let alone uh, the number of people. But I tell people, mostly, you're not missing out too much in the freshman experience. So I think most freshman uh, college courses, pretty much this is what you do most of the semester. So you've already done it, and you'll learn how to do it on paper. And uh, so the next couple days, this problem set, you can declare that a lab experience and feel like uh, you have saved yourself an incredible amount of time by not actually being in a laboratory doing the drip, 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 drip uh, experiments. So you're not missing out on too much for this. Later courses, I think the labs become increasingly valuable to understanding the material, and it uh, can be a lot of fun. And of course, research experience is fantastic. The Europe program here is, is spectacular. All right. so. Um, Acid-based titrations here. All right, so let's let's look at um, the shapes of the other kind of curve. So um, we can do the reverse experiment and have strong acid up here dripping into strong base. And so in the beginning, you just have strong base. So you're up here in the curve. You add some until you get to the stoichiometric or equivalence point, and then it's equal amounts of acid and base. And then uh, as you keep adding, your pH drops because then you start having more uh, strong acid in here. So these are the, the shapes of, uh, of these curves. And uh, you should know how, how to draw these. And you should know how to calculate various different points on those curves. So uh, let's look at that. So here we have a strong base. and. Uh, NaOH, and it's being titrated with a strong acid, HCl. And so we're going to calculate just a couple of points on that curve. So let's, um, let's start by doing five, at five mils of the acid that's been added to 25 milliliters of our strong base. And let's figure out what the pH will be at uh, 5. So first, what we have to do is calculate how much OH is present. And remember, for strong acids, strong bases, uh, you say that the amount of NaOH added is going to be equal to the amount of OH formed. So it completely, the NaOH completely ionizes into uh, sodium plus and OH minus. <coughs> 
So we can calculate the number of moles. We know uh, the volume. We know the concentration. So we had 25 mils. Uh, we know this. We can calculate the uh, numbers of moles. And then we have to figure out how much acid was added. We added five milliliters. So what does that correspond to in terms of moles? Again, it's a strong acid. So we can say for the amount of HCl that was added, we have formed completely hydronium ions. So it's completely ionized. It's a strong acid. You have a complete conversion to the acidic form to, uh, to hydronium ion. So we had five um, mils times the concentration of acid that was given, and now we know how many moles of acid were added. So now we're going to have a reaction between the base and the acid. So these will react. And so if we had uh, 6.25 times 10 to the minus 3 moles of hydroxide ion, and we're going to subtract the amount of acid that, that is formed to find out how much OH is left. So we just subtract those. There's a complete reaction one to one. And so uh, we just subtract the amount of acid to get the uh, numbers of moles. Then we need to convert that to molarity. So here we have the number of moles that we just calculated divided by our new volume so we added 5 mils of acid, and we had 25 mils to begin with. So now we have 30 total, and we can calculate the concentration. And I'll just uh, mention that this is one of the common mistakes that people make on exams when you're hurrying and is not to uh, come to actually figure out the total volume that you have at that moment. So you know, put maybe a little star by it to remind yourself to, uh, to do this uh, addition here, because if you have the wrong volume, all your numbers start coming out very strangely. All right, so once you have the concentration, then it's easy to calculate uh, pOH. So now this is, again, the concentration of hydroxide ions that we had. So we're, if we ha take the minus log of that, we get the pOH. And then we need to uh, change it to pH. All of the problems you'll do are at room temperature. So you can always use 14 for your conversion. And you come out with a pH of 13.18. Uh, so now we have our first, our first uh, spot on the titration curve. So we had volume of acid. We're adding, we were adding 5 mils to begin with. This is pH. And we're starting out here. And it's back a little. So at 5 mils, we're up at 13.18. So we're at quite basic pH. And remember that as you're doing these problems, if you had ended here with a pH and decided that was your pH, think about the fact that you have mostly strong base at that point, you realize you need to do this conversion to go to pH. So now let's figure out about the equivalence point. We need to know the volume to get to the equivalence point. How much acid do we need to add? Well, initially, we know how much OH was present. So at the equivalence point, by the name equivalence or stoichiometric, you need equal amounts of the acid. So if this is how much we had in moles, this is how much we're going to need in moles of HCl. So we just need to find out what volume we need to add to get those numbers of moles. And so here are the moles. This was the concentration of, of acid we were given. And so that means we're going to need 18.4 uh, uh, milliliters to reach the uh, stoichiometric or equivalence point. And what will be the pH at that equivalence point? Strong acid mixed with a strong base. Seven, it'll be neutral. So somewhere around here, we're going to have a pH of seven when we get to 
0.4 milliliters of acid added. So strong acid, strong base, the equivalence point pH will always be 7. If you're starting to talk about a weak acid or a weak base, it won't be 7. But for strong acid, strong base, it'll always be 7, it'll always be neutral. OK, so what about if we add 1 mil extra? So we've reached the stoichiometric or equivalence point, and now we're going to add an extra mil of acid. Uh, what's going to happen? So you can do this a couple of different ways. I think this is probably the simplest. It's just to say, all right, how many extra moles is that? So the concentration was 0.34. Uh, we're adding one milliliter extra. So we're going to add 3.4 times 10 to the minus 4 moles of acid extra. And then we just need to find out the concentration of that. And the only trick here, again, is to remember that you have to add up all of the correct volume. So you had 25 to begin with. You've added 18.4 milliliters to get to the equivalence point, And you've added one mil beyond the equivalence point. So we have this new uh, volume. And we have this number of moles of acid. So then you can ca calculate um, the concentration from that. And then take minus log of that number to uh, get the pH. And so we can put that down here. So when we go sort of one, one, mil be, or one milliliter beyond, now we're down at a pH around uh, 2, let's see, what is it, 2.116. So we started, we're at very basic pH. We added 18.4 milliliters to get to pH 7 to the equivalence point. And then if we keep adding acid, the pH drops pretty dramatically, and now you're quite acidic. So that's how you would calculate uh, points on a curve for a strong acid, strong base titration. And so we'll have two kinds of curve shapes here. Uh, this one that we just talked about. And then, of course, if you're going the other direction, you'll start at uh, low pH when you have acid, reach the st uh, stoichiometry point at pH 7, and then keep going. As you add more base, it'll get more basic. So now let's talk about when the acid is weak or strong. And so the only kinds of problems here, you either have strong with strong, or you have a weak acid with a strong base, or a strong, ba or, um, strong, strong, and then we also could have a weak base and a strong acid. But you're never going to have two weak things titrating each other. So that's not a kind of problem you'll see. Now here I just want to show the difference in curve shapes. So we talked about this one, this uh, strong with strong uh, curve shape, where the equivalence point is pH 7. Now, let's look at the difference over here when the acid that's being titrated is weak. So a couple things you'll notice. One is that the equivalence point no longer has a pH of 7. It's a pH that's greater than 7. And another thing that you'll notice is the curve shape down here is kind of odd. It flattens out in a region. And this is called the buffering region. And partway through the buffering region, in the, in the middle of the buffering region, you have a point called the half equivalence point. And that's uh, the point when you've added half of the volume to convert half of the acid that you started with to its conjugate. So you're halfway to the equivalence point. And that's a, a special kind of category of problem. So let's look at what's happening at various points in this titration. So let's look at what happens when you start this problem. So when you start doing a uh, titration problem, and you have a weak acid being titrated with a strong base, at volume equals 0, all you have is your weak acid. So all you have is a weak acid. And so this is a weak acid in water problem. So at the very start of the titration, that's the first problem that we worked in class. You have a weak acid and water problems. So you know how to, how to do, solve those. And so this is, this is on my little cartoon for an acid. So we have A, and we have the, it's HA. And so this is going to be titrated off. 
So we're going to be, the acid is going to be losing uh, its proton or hydrogen ion to interact with a strong base. So now when we start adding the strong base, we're going to move into this buffering region here. And so as we're adding the strong base, the strong base is going to start stripping off the protons or the hydrogen atoms and leaving the conjugate base of the weak acid that we had to begin with. And so when you have an acid and its conjugate base both present in solution, that's a buffer problem. So you can be going both directions. And the buffering region is the region of the plot that's pretty much flat. And what does flat mean? Well, flat means this is against the scale of pH, so flat means the pH isn't changing much. Well, that's what a buffer does. It keeps the pH fairly constant. So you're going to be moving into this buffering region. And if you were doing these kind of titrations in lab, these are even more frustrating than the ones I just showed you, because when you reach the buffering region, keep adding and adding and adding, and the pH is not changing at all. You're just adding and adding, and the pH is not changing. All of a sudden, it just goes wild, and you jump way up to here. And so that's, that's what's happening in this curve. You don't have much of a pH change in this region. All right, so when we get to the middle point of the buffering region, we have a special category. And the volume here is the volume at the half equivalence point. So you've added half the number of moles, in this case, of the strong base that you need. So when you've added half the amount, you've converted half of the acid to its conjugate base. So you have a 50-50 mixture here. So this is a special category when the amount of the weak acid equals the amount of the conjugate base that's being formed. And notice as we go up, here it was all acid, here there's some mixture, here there's more mixture. So you're, you're titrating off, you're pulling off these hydrogen ions as the titration goes forward. Once we reach the equivalence point, you pulled off all the hydrogen ions. You removed all of the protons uh, from the weak acid. Now all you have is the conjugate base. Really what you formed here is a salt, but this salt is a conjugate base of a weak acid, so it's going to be basic. It's really just a weak base and water problem. And that's why the pH is greater than 7 here, because what you're left with at the equivalence point, when you've pulled off all of the protons, is a base. So it'll be above 7, not dramatically above 7 because it's a weak base, but it'll be above 7. And then as you keep going, you still have this around, you still have the conjugate base around, but now you're really just adding strong base. It's not reacting with anything. So you're jumping up in pH quite dramatically as you do that. And really, this is just a strong base and water problem like the one that we just talked about. So in doing one titration, all these points along here, you're doing a weak base problem, a buffer problem, a special category of buffer problem, a weak base problem, and a strong base problem. So in every titration, there's just five different really kinds of problems. You just need to recognize where you are in the titration and which type of problem you should be doing. So just going the other direction, uh, it's the same, same thing in reverse. Now here we have a weak base that we're titrating with a strong acid at volume equals zero. It's just a weak base problem. As you start to add acid, the acid is protonating the base. And so now you have some conjugate acid of your weak base. So again, it's a buffer problem. At the half equivalence point, these guys are equal to each other. You have, you've converted half of your weak base to its conjugate acid. And when, when you get to the equivalence point, you've converted all of your weak base to its conjugate acid. So this is a weak acid and water problem. And uh, so we would expect the pH here to be less than 7 because we're acidic at this point. And when we get all the way past the equivalence point, then we're just talking about how much extra strong acid we've added. So again, it's the same type of problems. Uh, and in this case, you're protonating. You're starting with base, and you keep protonating it until you've converted it all to acid. <clears throat> 
Okay, so let's see if we can do a couple of points along this, this curve. So now we're talking about a weak acid being titrated with a strong, with a strong base. And I'll move fairly quickly through some of these because we've already seen how to do these parts a couple of times. The trick to titration is just to recognize what type of problem it is. So um, in the beginning, we've added no base. So this is just a weak acid problem. So we have our acid in water forming hydronium ion and a conjugate base we're given a Ka value. So this is just a weak acid problem. We can set up our plot here. We had 0.1 um, molar to begin with, and at equilibrium, we'll have 0.1 minus x, x, and x. We can plug this into the Ka expression, x squared over 0.1 minus x. We can assume x is small. Simplify this to x squared over 0.1. Solve for x, which is now 0.00421. We can check that this is less than 0.1, and it is. It's less than 5%, and it's 4.2, so it is less than 5%, so we're OK. We can make that assumption. We don't have to use the quadratic equation. And so then we can plug x, which is the hydronium ion concentration, into this expression and uh, solve for our pH. So then we can put a plot over here. We have one point, and here is this volume of base added versus pH. And we start down here before we've added any base, and we're at a pH of 2.38. All right, so now let's look at a problem in the buffering region uh, real quickly. So now what happens if we've added some small amount, 5 mils, uh, less than the volume at the equivalence point of our base? So the OH is strong. It'll react completely uh, with the, um, it'll react completely with our acid. It's much stronger than the conjugate. So um, we'll have a reaction. So we need to do the subtraction at first. Just to assume the amount of uh, strong base you add will react completely with whatever acid is available. So we know how much acid we had to begin with. A volume and a concentration, so we know the number of moles. We have um, also can calculate the number of moles of hydroxide ion. We know the volume added and we know the concentration, so we have this number of moles. Then the moles after the reaction, so we had point, uh, 2.5 times 10 to the 3 before, and now we subtract the amount of hydroxide ion and we come up with the new moles of acid, the moles of acid that are left, and that that amount of base is also going to produce the conjugate. So this guy is going to be converted to this guy, so we'll have that number of moles of uh, conjugate base that's formed. So this is like a buffer problem. Uh, we need to convert to molarity first, and so we know the volume. We had 25 mils, plus we've now added 5 and we have two new concentrations that we can plug in here. So that's how much acid we have left after the reaction with OH. This is how much conjugate is formed after the reaction, and then at equilibrium. And uh, we can just go through, make the same approximations that this is small, come up with X, check it, and come up with a new pH. OK, so that's option one. And on Wednesday, we'll talk about another option for the buffer problem, which is looking at the Henderson-Hasselbach.